So welcome everyone to the seventh panel in the series on decolonizing Europe. Uh, my name is Tasnim Anwar and together with my colleague Beste Dayen and the Amsterdam Center uh, for European Studies, I co-convene the series. Uh, during the series, we discuss a variety of topics from a post-colonial and decolonial perspective. And I'm very happy and excited that today we'll be talking about decolonizing the museum with this excellent panel. Uh, before I introduce them to you, I just want to uh, briefly say that this topic is very timely. Uh, as only yesterday, an advisory committee named Colonial Collections and Acknowledgement of Injustice uh, concluded that Dutch museums actually need to return colonial stolen artifacts if requested so by, Dutch for, uh, by former Dutch colonies. Uh, this advice was further supported by a major museum in the Netherlands, such as the Museum and the Tropen Museum. Uh, the report by the Commission furthermore shows that there is much more need for research and knowledge and discussion about the colonial histories and the context of museums and what kind of stories are told through exhibitions and the object at display. Uh, so today uh, we will discuss this very timely topic with our distinguished speaker and I'm very proud and honored uh, to introduce them to you. Um, so first I would like to in introduce Quincy Gario who is a visual artist and a performance poet. Uh, in, he, in his work, he focuses on decolonial remembering and disruption. His most well-known work is Black Peter's Racism, Racism or Zwarte Piet's Racisme, in which he critically examines how much is known about the racist Dutch practice of Zwarte Piet, um, which uh, features people dressing up in blackface. Quincy Gario is also the winner of many awards for his work, among them the 2016 Black Excellence Award and the Amsterdam Fringe Festival Silver Award in 2015. He is a member of the Pan-African Artist Collective State of L3 and a Humanity in Action uh, Senior Fellow. And currently he is a researcher with the Brussels-based performance and scenography studies. Welcome, Quincy. Second distinguished speaker is uh, Chiara de Cesari, who is an Associate Professor in European Studies and Cultural Studies at University of Amsterdam. Uh, her research explores how institutional manifestations uh, of memory, heritage, art, and cultural politics are shifting under conditions of globalization. And in particular, uh, she looks at how colonial legacies live on today, especially in museums. Chiara also leads the NWO funded VD project, Imagining Institutions Otherwise, Art, Politics, and State Transformation. And then last but not least, uh, Professor Wayne Modis, who is the head of the Research Center of Material Culture. He's a professor of material culture and heritage and critical heritage studies in the Faculty of Humanities at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Um, Wayne Modis was previously head of the curatorial department at the uh, Tropen Museum, uh, keeper of anthropology at the Horniman Museum in London, and director of the Museums of History and Ethnography in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, his research interests include issues of belonging and displacement, material mobilities, contested heritage with a special focus on slavery, colonialism, and post-colonialism. And if I understood correctly, uh, Wayne and Chiara, you're also currently working together on a project called uh, Curating the Colonial, which sounds fascinating. I hope we can talk about it as well. A uh, warm welcome to all of you uh, in this panel. I'm happy and excited that you could be here today. Um, talking about this very important and, and actual topic. So we have structured the conversation through four topics. Um, and I would just like to start at the beginning um, and ask you about museums and the imaginaries of the state. Um, so as we know, uh, museums are important spaces where imaginaries are produced and displayed about, for example, geopolitical events, but also the nation state and its history. Um, so my question would be, how is Europe, and more specifically the Netherlands one, um, envisioned through these museums and their collections? And how does this also produce racialized and racist images about Europe? Quincy, can I give the floor? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's you, you can think of it in, in various ways, um, like the colonial collections, but you can also think of it of um, through the collections that have been acquired by art museums. Um, what's the image that's been produced of the state that we want to collect and keep? And I think what you see in a lot of the 
collections from art museums, um, you see a certain type of understanding of who belongs to the Dutch nation or who gets to speak about the Dutch nation. Um, and you see different attempts throughout time to disrupt that. And I think it's really interesting to be in this current period in which in those museums, we have a lot more people that are willing to disrupt from the inside and not just um, standing outside and, and trying to move the brick and mortar change. Um, and that's why it's it's really awesome to be in this talk. And, and thanks again for inviting me, Tasneem and Beste. Um, because I mean, a person like Wayne and what he's doing in the way how the Trope Museum is not just connecting um, these ideas of what the nation could be um, to the past collection, but also to future collections and current collections. Um, and I had the pleasure and the honor to be part of an exhibition that was at the World Museum uh, last or this year. Um, it already feels last year. Time goes quick. Um, in which the collection was also as a starting point for a larger conversation um, about how do we imagine nation. And I think these are the types of projects and initiatives through which we can imagine a different understanding of who gets to belong and who gets to claim in a certain sense. Yes, thank you so much. And just following up, you briefly uh, mentioned uh, Wayne's role also in this in the Trophy Museum. Wayne, could you maybe elaborate on your uh, experience and your expertise how museums play a role in this envisioning of the nation state. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uncertain that Quincy has, has not said it all already. Um, I mean, it, there is a, um, a kind of long history of us thinking about the museum as, as forming part of how the nation is imagined. I mean, and if one were to go back even to Benedict and Anderson's um, imagined communities, then one would see the museums and the archive being part of that, of the technology through which we understand what the nation is, what the community is, the nation state, as a, the nation as a community is. Um, and you see that also there's a brilliant article, I think, um, by Stuart Hall, um, which is probably about 25 years now, who's heritage, where he also um, thinks through the question of heritage and how we constitute the, the nation as a space and what is at stake in that. So museums by nature, um, sites for history writing, sites for writing victories, sites for writing how we want to see ourselves as, as nations, as regions, as peoples, are definitely in, enmeshed in a practice of um, imagining what the nation is. And by that fact, also imagining what the nation is not, right? And therefore, what you've seen over the years, and that's why actually we're in a very wonderful moment now, where the um, project of, of, of activism that is happening outside of the institution has been taking the museum to task by asking again and again, but more urgently recently, how can Europe be constituted as an imaginary without questions of the colonial being part of that imaginary? What is at stake when we try to write a history only of victories and our own freedom when we don't write histories that is also about how we've made others unfree. What is at stake in the collections that we collect, the collections that we hold and say that these are the national collections, but those collections themselves exclude so large part of, of, of who is constituted to be the nation. And so there, that kind of critique has been coming more and more recently through different lenses of silence past, silence constituencies. Um, but more urgently now, I think, it has been coming through the lens of anti-racism, racism and anti-racism. And that actually, um, perhaps the language of silences and aphasia and occlusion 
um, are nice to try and understand how the nation brackets its own understanding of itself through its through its um, infrastructures, and by that I mean intellectual as well as, as physical infrastructure. But what it doesn't also what it what it misses sometimes is the ways in which um, we are silenced to um, what violences those occlusions um, create in terms of that exclusion. Much questions have been asked about museums that name themselves national to ask who is the nation, who constitute the nation. And so actually, I think it's a really exciting time and moment for museums. And I must say a tense moment for museums. <laughs> Not an easy moment for museums. As we've been called to, to critically reassess again and again, how we are complicit in these histories of violent exclusion and silences. So yes, museums, I think, are part of the infrastructure of how the, 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 the nation is continually being re-inaugurated, but also the spaces where one can look to see how, um, to see how um, through the structures of power that curators like in the museums have, we continue to write many constituents, many histories, many lives outside of the possibility of, of being um, a part of the nation. And a big part of this, and I'll close here, is, is not necessarily just about citizenship and belonging and the politics of, of citizenship of, and belonging, but is a way in which the museums are constituted as well to define who is human enough to be a citizen. Right, so the, the relationship between citizenship and the very idea of humanity, which I always criticize, not necessarily the ethnographic museum for as a racializing project, but also the art museums that continue to have a strange understanding of itself that says that some people produce art and other people, I stop there, they don't produce. So in, in that way, I, I'm interested as well that we, 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 we unpack the brackets that we think of as colonial and stop looking only at the ethnographic museums, but see how that is intricately bound up to natural history museums as well, that also constitute a notion of what the nation is, to art museums, to history museums, because in that conglomerate of what a museum is and its different types, one sees how they help to define the borders of how we understand the who is the us and the who is the them. Thank you so much for this uh, intellectual invitation, uh, which we hopefully uh, can pick up further throughout this discussion. Uh, I would like to pose the same question to Chiara, who also in her research has uh, examined this question both inside and outside Europe. Chiara, would you like to reflect on this as well? Well, first of all, uh, uh, thank you very much, Tasneem and Beste, for inviting me to this conversation. And uh, um, well, I, I guess uh, I won't add much more on the issue of the museum as representation of the nation and the way in which it constitutes, it produces a certain understanding of who belongs and who doesn't, I think. Wayne and Quincy have really sort of explained that particular, uh, uh, you know, mechanism very well. Uh, uh, perhaps what, what what I can do is um, uh, follow up on something that struck me about what you wrote to us, uh, Tasneem. You wrote to us, I mean, under the first question number one, uh, in the text you circulated among us and the questions that you asked, um, uh, your, your, your first sentence is museums are important spaces where imaginaries are produced and displayed. And somehow, while I was thinking about this, I got stuck. Uh, uh, um, uh, I kept on thinking about this notion of important spaces. Also because very often when you write about the politics of museums, people, activists, but uh, not only colleagues, argue that museums are not so important spaces. And uh, uh, and actually they are spaces that are elitist spaces only for a certain group of people. And indeed the ways in which museums have been constituted in the 19th century at the juncture of the national and the colonial project, they were clearly targeting I would say, the middle classes. 
But I think uh, there is something about the importance and the relevance of museums today, which I think, or I, uh, yeah, I, I, I wonder whether it's peculiar about the present time. And by this, I'm saying that in places like the Netherlands, museums, heritage, and art today are increasingly important sites to talk about major societal issues. I guess this is also why you invited us, you know, in this really very important series of events on decolonization, then you invited us to talk about museums. And I think this is also a signal of the fact that somehow, for some interesting reasons, museums are an an important place in, not everywhere, but certainly in the Netherlands, in places like Germany, for talking about major issue of the, you know, I'm now I'm here, I'm quoting Saidia Artman's and Wayne uh, elaboration on our notion of the afterlives of slavery and colonialism in present society and the question of institutional racism. And so, um, and, and probably something about that has to do with the immense, in a way, sort of the violence of museums, but also the immense richness of museums like the Tropen Museums, which holds a, you know, like an incredible cultural heritage that is being increasingly claimed from outside, so that it sort of, it opens up truly to a much broader public. Can I ask, like, who's the outside, Chiara? Well, <laughs> that's uh, uh, when. Well, I, uh, I, I, I was writing a paper now uh, for a talk next week, which is called, which starts with outside in, inside out. I think one of the key questions today is precisely sort of a struggle around the boundaries of the museums. So I'm now, I, I probably, I'm not sure when I said outside several times, but I'm, you know, what's, what's traditionally taken as the outside of the museum, which is be, in being increasingly questioned by, you know, activists and others, and uh, particularly, you know, the diasporas and uh, uh, the second generation of, uh, in the Netherlands, second, third generation of, uh, for example, you know, Dutch post-colonial citizens. So yeah, it's contested, you. the inside and the outside. <laughs> yes, caught me on that. Yeah, I know it's a great addition. And I think that it really points to, um, well, I, I, I'm not sure if it's something that is uh, limited to the, to the present day, but I think definitely there is a current important discussion on, in society that, that kind of blurs this inside out. And also, I think, um, blurs uh, a notion of past and present um, exactly by these kind of decolonial and post-colonial um, interventions to um, require from museums that they have this critical reflection on their own exhibitions and their own practices and their own meaning. So, um, and this is a nice um, bridge to my second question is that Temporality and especially the notion of modernity has something that we previously discussed on, on the series as well. Um, and I would like to invite you to think um, how uh, through this decolonial lens can we think differently about these notions of present and future. Um, and maybe to give a little bit of background towards this question, I'm inspired here by the work of Avery Gordon um, who looks at how past traces of colonial violence and uh, violence in the time of slavery always has this present absence in, you know, in all time. So the, the colonial violence is not something that is in the past and over with, but it continues to have this kind of effects and afterlives in our contemporary worlds, but also in the future. So I would like to invite you to think about how this is also the case in museum and the current debate that is going on now bringing these, um, bringing distortions to our linear thinking about past and present and future. Um, Chiara, can I uh, start with you uh, again, maybe taking off where you left off in the previous question? Well, I mean, this is in a way, it's a, it's a very complicated question. <laughs> and uh, um, 
I, I, I think that in a way, uh, you know, a short answer would be that museums are built on a very clear, uh, on, on a certain uh, understanding of time and temporality, which is a modern temporality, and also a very specific device of representing the nation in the past or as a sort of an entity with a continuous long-term existence in order to project it into the future. So this is also one of the power of the museums. So we think museums are about the past. So museums are both very modern uh, uh, institutions and at the same time constructed around a temporality which has clear um, sort of around the temporality with a clear distinction uh, between past, present and future. In fact, the ways in which the museum work and I think this is also what the colonial activists and artists are showing us very, cle very clearly these days through various actions and performances is precisely how this, you know, this, this sort of temporal scheme is not, uh, uh, in a way, it's, it, it's a fiction, it's an illusion. And this particular temporal fiction is very important to the, the ideological workings of the museum. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, would you like to uh, take off? Yeah. Um, I, funnily enough, I'm going to do something really, really shameful. Um, primarily because I'm, I'm now editing a book called Museum Temporalities that will come out uh, next year. So that's my shameful advertisement of the book. Um, fundamentally, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, the museum for me is actually fundamentally embedded in, in, a, in a certain and structural and a logic of temporality, not only in the idea of its modern formation and what that means, but also if you notice how museums are structured, they are structured across according to time in temporary exhibitions and permanent exhibitions. We have notions of perpetuity in museums. We should keep things forever. And that's how conservation is based in the idea of a foreverness. So fundamentally, embedded in the museum as a logic is this understanding of temporality. But there is also a temporality that is, 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 is a sort of, key, um, in many ways, in many museums as we understand them, is also this teleology yeah, that we are going to develop over time in this way that what, and we present that as museums as well. I, I want to do two things here in, in, as in response to your question. One, is first of all to suggest that the museum that I inhabit, but, but probably more broadly the museums that we all inhabit, maps again temporality, unraciality, and on questions of the human. So a full, a ethnographic museums will always map a certain kind of a Fabian out of time to those people who we collected. So they are different from us because we are modern and they are not. We struggle in our world today with ideas that tradition can actually exist in the contemporary. So we, we, we don't think that um, Native Americans can exist anymore um, because they are traditional and this is the modern world. And so museums structure those logic for the public. It is always amazing to see people come to kind of expect that certain people have died out already. And that is the foundational basis for for um, museums like mine that collected as a part of the idea of um, before they pass away, right? They were going to die. I've been thinking about that more recently within a conception, not necessarily of them passing away as in traditions that pass away and us as modern and, and Kiara kind of mentioned Tony Bennett's notion, birth of the museum. But I've been thinking about it in um, to switch the lens around that the museum has participated in acts of extinction. And how do we think of extinction and its temporalities? Not, not that they are going to pass away, but that we are passing them away. So I've been thinking about that. But the, the, the last thing I want to um, tie this to, and I think I want to thank Quincy as, as well, because he, he's one of the persons who've been keeping us on our toes. And that's nice, you know, it makes it really, <laughs> really exciting. But what Quincy, in, especially with Zwart Peter's his, his racism, but with other projects, is that he does something which I think um, Ariel Azule does in, in one of her books where she speaks about events 
and the eventfulness of something. Because actually, in line with what Kiara said, for many people, colonialism has not passed. <laughs> it is not a thing of the past. And so what we contend with is the ongoing coloniality of something, right? And therefore, in, as we look at certain displays, as we look at certain images, we see these images as past, whereas actually what they record is a kind of a political being which is, is just ongoing. Violence, violence, exclusion, exclusion. And I will close by saying this. If you ever were to just look at the discussion of diversity, we've been talking about it now for 25, 30 years, right? <laughs> and we keep talking about it over and over and over and over and over and over again, and it doesn't change. So in a way, that is the kind of eventfulness that never seemed to pass because there's something foundational to the temporality of the museum, which keeps this colonial event as an ongoing event. And that is exactly, I think, what we're trying to fight with now. How do we stop the duress, as um, Anstola would say, that colonialism holds us in, ensnares us in this ongoing coloniality? That's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I would like to take up the point of the ongoing coloniality, especially in, in, uh, especially in relation to traditions, because um, while you were saying that, I, I couldn't help but think of Quincy about your work on Zwartpiste Racism, because I think that tr tradition is one of the arguments to also keep a colonial past in the present. Um, not necessarily inviting you to reflect on, on this example per se, um, but this was something that came to my mind immediately uh, on how colonial pasts have multiple shapes also in the contemporary. Um, would you like to sh share your thoughts on this uh, with us, Quincy? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one one of the ways in which to think to think. Mm, no, I'll I'll use the example from the the World Museum in Rotterdam. So I made a work there in which I looked at salt. One of the reasons why the Netherlands went to the to the Caribbean was to look for salt, because the Spanish had cut off all the salt ports in Europe, um, because. The Dutch were like, we want to be our own nation, right? We want to be our own republic. And so one of the most interesting things is that if you look at the collection of salt in the National Museum of World Cultures, you'll find a lot of salt from all over the world, except from the Dutch Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's something there in which a near and far type of, you know, like a Hitchcock lens. You zoom in and then the background gets big, but then the picture itself, the person itself that's being zoomed in on stays the same. So I had a Hitchcock moment when I started looking into that. And then, I mean, I've had this conversation with, with Wayne a lot as well, is this idea of who is seen as outside of time and who is seen as inside of time, right? So whose culture and artifacts and, and crafts uh, whose art can be seen as something that places them perpetually outside of what we call modern times or postmodern times or um, in our time. And so one of the interventions I tried to do was to reintroduce salt into the collection and put them in conversation with collection pieces. So I had like sappy um, salt bowls next to salt that I made from Curacao and salt that I took back from St. Martin. And then you get this interesting clash that happens because they're not supposed to be in the same space. Um, they're not supposed to be having this trans historical conversation through this colonial infrastructure of the museum. I mean, the museum in Rotterdam itself has this peculiar history of being um, like the cabinet of curiosity from one of the, the Willems, right? One of the Willems oranges where they would just bring their stuff that they robbed from all over the world and place there. And so to have this conversation going on there um, was, was striking because it also gave an opportunity to think beyond um, the collection itself or what the collection did or how the collection was collected. 
And I think the questions that we can ask in terms of how do we shape this and how do we think about time is to constantly intervene and go beyond the intentions of these collections. The Stalic Museum, so this is, this is my shameless plug, um, at the moment, there's an exhibition going on called In the Presence of Absence. Um, and together with Mina Wawiris and a whole host of people, um, I made a work for that exhibition. And we're looking at the history of St. Maurice, um, the Sudanese Catholic saint, who we actually don't know a lot about. All we know about him is where he was born, uh, where he died, um, and that's it. And, and why and how he died, right? And so one of the things that we try to do is to think about carpet weaving and presenting carpet weaving as a means of thinking through ways in which history is, is remembered. This notion of constant remembering, the knots, um, the weaving, the sound, the conversations that happen during the weaving. And so what we present is, is a work in which Mina's aunt is singing a possible story of Maurice maybe passing through the village in southern Morocco on his way to the Swiss Alps, right? So you get this different type of thinking through the stories in which Black people function in the European imaginary. It's like, no, let's take that and let's try to present a different type of understanding of what St. Maurice could be, filling in this idea beyond servitude to Catholicism or beyond servitude to um, all of these types of brotherhoods and, and societies that have him as a patron saint. And so the notion of time there also becomes stretched and elliptical because we present a video and, a, and slide projections and an actual carpet or two tapestries in which time itself is suspended and also obliterated at the same time. So there's something, um, it's a chimera. But I think it's it's interesting for those of you who are looking, the attendees, to go and visit, hey, <laughs> <laughs> and then see if I'm I'm correct in in my intention of presenting it. But it is about thinking too, like the Stalic Museum and all these museums as places through which we can have these conversations about time um, and push beyond um, the borders of time as they're presented to us. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and also thank you for mentioning the current exhibition in the State Museum, the, um, the Francis of Absence. It, it also partly served as an inspiration for the third and fourth question that I had, which I will morph together in the interest of time. Uh, <laughs> uh, pun not intended. Um, and that is that... Uh, <laughs> Um, well, I can see actually your, also your description and the way in general how you do art and I think the academic and practical work, Chiara and, and Wayne, that you also are participating in shows that there is an opportunity for different types of representation, for disruption, for resistance, and especially in light with, of the current uh, advice by the committee um, that museums have to return uh, stolen artifacts based on the re request of uh, former colonies. I think it really kickstarts the discussion of imagining potential different futures of the museum. Um, so I would like to, uh, to, to end with this question uh, to all three of you, how we can also imagine opportunities um, for reimagining the, the museum. Um, and before I uh, turn the, the floor to one of you, I would also like to remind the audience that you can drop your questions in uh, the Q&A box um, and we can pick them up in after this, uh, this uh, final discussion. Uh, Wayne, can I invite you first to uh, reflect on this? How do you see uh, possibilities for disruption, resistance, reimagining? Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, you, 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 you stated your, your question a little bit more, um, and I'm going to use a terrible word here, don't mind me, more, more aggressively in the paper, which I like. You said something about emptying or transforming. I like that. That, is, that gives you more, more um, um, spannings. Um, what's that? Um, um, tension. Um, in, in a way, um, um, Tasneem, to be honest with you, there are, there's a double side for me to that question. On the one hand, 
I've been a part of a lot of discussions about abolishing, abolishing the museum as a structure, that it is need, not tenable anymore or whatever. And my response has always been um, a kind of Bob Marley response. Until the moment when that happens, we still need to change it because it won't happen immediately. So, so uh, until that moment, then something needs to happen, right? And a part of that is the work that 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 we are people are trying to do right now. And and I must say that we're we as a museum are trying to do. How to do that is what we in our museum would um, taking up what your starting point about decolonization and um, is is to take decolonization. For us anyway, not as a an event, not as, as, as an event, but as something that is so bound up in the institutional's body politic, in its body, that one cannot get around it, right? Very often in many museums that I know as well, decolonization becomes the event that you do on a Saturday afternoon and you invite Quincy to help you to do that event. For me, that is not where the solution lies. For me and for us here, it lies in the fact that our conservation department needs to be decolonized. <laughs> because conservation itself sets a set of paradigms, which also makes it sometimes impossible for objects to be returned. Conservation itself is colonial. It means that, that we have to understand that the categories that we've come to use, whether or not it is fashion, design, art, craft, whatever, all of those are also a part of the coloniality of our institution. It requires that we ask ourselves the question about are we racist as staff? Because, you know, starting out by an, an a university you should ask this question over and over again. Getting diverse bodies into your institution is the beginning. Keeping them <laughs> safe and carefully is the, the work that needs to be done. So my answer to you is, I don't know what the question can even be if the museum should change, but that the museum has to change. That decoloniality is something that one has to do if we are to survive in any way at all and continue to do any work. And for me, for us, we, we take that as a intricately bound up with every single member of staff and every single practice that we do as an institution. Now, how that turns out, I don't know yet, we'll see. Um, but it's a part of the commitment that we, 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 we have as an institution. Thank you, Wayne, for this uh, very honest uh, answer. Uh, Kiara, can I invite you to reflect? Um, well, um, like Adi, uh, sir, I, I want to start with a quote uh, by somebody who actually uh, worked, or she was, I think, a visiting fellow for a while at the at the Tropen Museum with Maya Kasim, and she worked for some time as an um, you know independent curator in a British museum to curate a series of exhibition on the colonial past and the afterlives of the colonial past. And at the end of her experience, she wrote an article that circulated a lot among uh, activists, but also some museum people, which was basically entitled, which was entitled something like a museum uh, will not be decolonized. And sort of the, 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 the piece was about the impossibility of decolonizing what is a structurally a colonial institution like museum. I mean, we, we, we touched upon different aspects, the temporality, the production of different temporality, uh, and, and other ways in which the museum produces and reproduces violence. But, and, and at the same time, inspired a lot, but also by my, by my work with museums in Palestine, uh, at one point, I, I, I think I came to think that failure is very much part of the decolonizing process of our institution, but it's something like, uh, I think Derrida calls it the possible impossible. So it's an impossibility and a failure that we need to continue trying. It's a bit of the Samuel Beckett's, uh, uh, you know, fail again, fail better. So in a way, it, 
how, how can you decolonize a colonial institution? That's also what, you know, the questions for many Palestinians who are trying to set up museums and use them as space for thinking a political otherwise, some of them ask, how can you sort of work, uh, can you do decolonizing work through a colonial institution? And I think, I mean, there is such a richness to the museum that that process of decolonization, which Wayne was, was talking about, is something that is both impossible and necessary for all of us to do from inside and outside of the museum. Yeah, thank you so much, Chiara. And I think that one of the leading figures who is already doing inside and outside the museums, of course, so can see how, how do you see this question of the even the possibility of decolonizing well I mean I think um, yeah <laughs> yeah I mean you, you have the case of of the activists who recently you know took a statue from the African Museum right um, and one of the most interesting things which I found from the video, I mean, if you follow, if you watch the video, is you see him initially, and I couldn't really follow it all that well because it was in French. Um, you see him following a certain care for the object, right? For the statue, for what it meant, for the sculpture. And then he walks out with it. And then you hear some guards in the background shout, hey, hey, sir, hey, sir. And he just keeps walking, you know, he's confident. Then the cops show up and the way how they treat the object is completely different. They just take it from him, pull it from him, and you're seeing a certain type of state institutional violence happening there. Where the community itself was taking care of it or trying to take care of it. I had some, some friends from the area who told me if he took like a back road, he would have been in Germany and it would have been a completely different conversation. <laughs> but then to think about the ways in which this notion of retrieval and repairing and trying to um, to deal with the violence that the museum houses and, and is institutionalized to to display, um, it is about like how do we treat these types of interventions? How do we go along with it? And so, I'm 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 gonna. I'm going to be a little bit cheeky. One of the things in the report that came out today was also this notion of all of the objects need to go back and all of the nations who ask for them can get them back or should get them back without any reservations. And here is where I had a little bit of like a, hmm, how does this work? Because this is once again going along with the idea of the mid 19th century, you know, con concept of the state. So here again, some of these nations where these objects come from, some of these communities where these objects come from, don't exist anymore because specifically of the colonial violence that brought them into these collections in the first place. So this notion of decolonizing according to state lines is an impossibility or is a means of dealing with the problem but not dealing with the problem, right? And so then I think it also is a way of shutting out um, a certain type of diaspora communities that want to, to deal with it or want to talk about it within the context of here and now in Europe and not just in faraway countries, right? Because I think that's also one of the things which kind of gets lost in these conversations about decolonizing. It's always connected to an elsewhere instead of a present here. So what does the presence here of these post-colonial diaspora communities um, how can their contributions to this decolonization lead to a different understanding of these brick and mortar collections, um, different dissemination and access to them? And it's not just access to objects, but also simply to listening, uh, to archives, to information about acquisition and how they were acquired. I mean, for the exhibition in the, in the World Museum, I got access to, to the, to the, to the, system that the National Museum uses. And it's amazing. I mean, all of the 
script that's in there is so cool. <laughs> and actually, you would want everyone to know this or everyone to have access to it. And I think one of the issues in which decolonization can really happen is not just in the return of these objects, but also in the access to information about who was responsible for their presence here and now. And how can we use that access to information to foster different types of, you know, questions? Because I think sometimes, and I hear I'm going back to what Wayne said earlier, sometimes we keep circling back, right? And we keep coming back to the same question. And it's about like, should we return or should we not return? And I'm like, okay, been there, done that. Now it's about how do we talk about return and what is return? Is return simply the object returning or is it a question of dignity and and the understanding of the construction of humanity through the disposition and through the violence done to others. How do we return those types of those types of values? Oh. Sorry, Wayne. <laughs> no, don't worry. I was just simply saying nice. So, so it's all right. <laughs> I think, Kiara, you also wanted to respond to uh, to this. Yeah, if I can say something briefly, because I see we don't have much time for the discussion. So I try to be very short because, you know, what Vinci said really made me think of a lot of different things. Uh, but first of all, I really think that um, art is one of the ways in which a sort of art and artists can help us think, return in uh, sort of, well, the multiple meanings and forms of returns in a much broader understanding and much more productive understanding of the term. So this is one sort of comment. But the other comment, and I hope I will still work with museums after I say this, is I think we shouldn't fear the empty museum. And actually, uh, I think because in a way, a lot of, you know, I, I was just, um, you know, a, a lot of museums directors, a lot of, there is a lot of anxiety about this idea of the museum being all of a sudden being emptied of its treasures. And I think, I mean, uh, well, you know, a lot, and a lot of uh, people, you know, are very, very are rushed to say, oh, this is uh, not realistic, is not going to happen anyway, and it's going to have, it's going to be about a couple of objects and that's it. And I think in a way, first of all, I think this sort of notion of this fear of the empty museum is being used by some museums to uh, sort of avoid really talking about what's really what's the matter is about, which is justice and what's just and what's uh, and it's about inequality and especially historical justice and, and right and what's wrong. But it's also that, you know, there are many ways in which the empty museum, I think, is an interesting concept and place to think with. And I'm thinking about, again, I come from a Palestinian experience where the empty museum is a trope for thinking about what happens when all your objects have been stolen? So you want to create a museum, but you have nothing to place in there because you don't have your heritage because it's located somewhere else. And my last connection is a museum that really made a big uh, impression on me. This was the Jewish Museum by Libeskin when it opened in the 90s in Berlin. And for three years, it was empty. And this is, was one of the, uh, and, and there was something, uh, you know, the, the, the question, the, the issue was on the one end, non-representability of something like the Holocaust, and also the sort of the experience of loss through spatial uh, means. And I'll let Wayne talk because it's, it's a very long uh, 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 issue, but I think it's an important one, very important one. I mean, um, just very quickly, I don't think, well, in all museum anyway, and you'll see that in the paper as well, as this report came out, there is no anxiety that our museum, museums will be empty. I think that there is a conception in many curatorial head, and, and probably not so many, actually, that immediately everything is going to go back. What that does is that it also constitutes an understanding. And this goes back to what Quincy said, because perhaps if we knew more about how things came, then we would be less worried about things all going back, right? <laughs> because it is a little bit more complicated than that in, in one sense. But but I, I'm going to go as a museum person now and say, this is a lovely theoretical discussion. It's nice. Kiara, what you said, the empty museum, and it's lovely to say that. And Quincy, you're an artist, so it is lovely. But you know, for the everyday public, that means very different things. 
sites, right? So one has to also understand the museum as a public site and what that public site does for a general public. There is an anecdote in Germany, I remember where the first curatorial strategy of a, a director was to empty the walls of the museum. And immediately as he did that, many people came and they remembered the loss of the, when the works were stolen. So strategically, it's lovely. But let us also think from a pragmatic, useless museum person who says, um, many people come here to see things and hear stories. Okay, that's one thing. The last thing that I want to say is this. Um, in, in Caribbean theorization, um, um, Kamal Brulich, I think it is, is insistent that we don't use the word creolize, but we use the word creolization. And the ization is important for him as an, an attempt to speak about the, the unendingness of what is happening about the impossibility of what is happening. And therefore, I like to speak of colonization and not just decolonize, because what it does is that it, it, it indicates the processual nature of what is, is happening. And also that is a, a labor, a burden, a work that we, we need to continually do because the structure will reform itself. It is such a capaciously difficult, violent structure that once we make a change, it will change back a little bit. It is an ongoing work. And my last point is, that's exactly what return is. Because fundamentally bound up to the notion of return, especially as you speak in relationship to um, Holocaust histories, but also colonial history, is that the notion of return as a conceptual argument cannot ever end. It is not that you, you know where you're going back to. What that back to is, is an impossibility anyway. And that's why I like notions of return and repair because they allow us to realize the burden that is, is fundamentally embedded in the work that we need to do as a horizon for justice and not that justice is going to happen tomorrow. It is something that you have to always fight for. Thank in you. repair, the, the, the wounds are always going to be seen or there. You're not going to get rid of them. Thank you Wayne, so much for this and um, we're running, uh, we're coming close to the end of the event, but I didn't want to cut you off because it's such an amazing discussion, but we have lots of interesting questions for the audience. So uh, I hope you won't mind if we just go to the Q&A um, and, and see uh, if we can take some of these uh, great questions. Um, so uh, I have a question uh, here from uh, Asli who asks, I'm generally interested in hearing the speaker's view on the notion of shared her heritage. Uh, is it an abandoned concept? Can it help us imagine cultural heritage uh, beyond nations? Um, Quincy, can I invite you to uh, take up this question? Um, shared heritage? Um, <laughs> let me, let we me want to pass it to Wayne. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the thing is that it's 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 quite easy. Hasty knows my opinion about this already. I think I I know this word, but um, the, the the question isn't about shared heritage because I don't that that concept has been criticized so much probably for the last fifteen years or whenever the concept came into being. Shared heritage is an attempt to make colonial um, tensions huggy huggy. It's, it's, it's what I call decolonization with a hug. Um, um, that, that doesn't allow us to understand where the violences are. So we say, oh, we share this heritage with Indonesia, or we share it with the, with the Caribbean, or we share it with whatever. For me, that concept proposes too much of an equality that sharing is implicit in sharing, which what that does is that it occludes the violence of the histories about which we speak. Of course, we can share some things, but when you're talking about colonial histories, shared heritage is a, is a, a nice way to, to smooth over inequality, violence, and injustice, in my opinion. It, it reminds me of like the concept of super diversity we are also like what? Like like no. No. 
Um, I have a very interesting question for uh, Chiara, um, one that I would also like to know the, uh, the answer to. Uh, and that is, uh, can Chiara tell a little bit more about the Palestinian case, where there is no possibility to talk about um, postness of settler colonialism? Uh, do we need a conceptual difference between colonialism and present legacy in colonial context and the ongoing colonialism in terms of times that are produced and exhibited in museums? Chiara, could you uh, briefly respond to uh, this uh, inquiry? Well, I mean, of course, of course, there are differences. And these are some that we are, uh, you know, also exploring in a series of projects together with Wayne. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the assumptions that, uh, uh, you know, came up clearly in the in the discussion and uh, uh, before is that one of the basic assumptions of uh, the uh, decolonizing activism and the kind of decolonizing that is going on at the moment in museums uh, in the Netherlands and elsewhere is precisely that the post in post-colonialism is a very problematic notion that in fact you know that that's the whole notion of the afterlives of colonialism in Saidiya Artsman's uh, 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 words or colonial durabilities in Stoller and Stoller words so the idea that in a way we think you know, colonialism is past, colonialism is not past because its legacy are still very much at work in our uh, society today. So in a way, uh, it's, it's obvious that, you know, there is, you know, settler colonialism, it's a reality in Palestine and it's going ongoing as settler colonialism. And this is clearly different from, from colonialism, you know, as it's, uh, uh, as it manifests itself today in a place like Amsterdam, but still, you know, sort of the basic assumption of both is that this idea of the post is a question mark. This is also what 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 Stoller talks about, and I think what what came, uh, I mean, what was something interesting. I mean, it's a long story. Uh, uh, um, the question of the Palestinian museums is a very interesting one and very productive one to think with, uh, because. There are plenty, there is a kind of a museum fever at the moment, I mean, in a place like the West Bank, and museums are becoming, they're mostly sort of grassroots museums or museum NGOs. Uh, some of them are becoming quite big, state-like, some others remain very close to the grassroots, but museums in a place like the West Bank today are really, uh, uh, you know, creating interesting spaces for thinking about politics, after the failure of formal political structure and political visions. And in a way, I think there are interesting connections with what's going on here, both in terms of the, of the role of the museum as a place to think about and to act upon societal injustice today, and in terms of the question of the, of the post. Thank you so much for this uh, elaborate question. Um, if it's okay with the three of you, I'm just going to take one uh, last question um, that I will pose to all of you. Um, and also with that uh, request of a one minute reflection <laughs> as a kind of final uh, statement, um, which uh, I think is an interesting uh, topic to take up is indeed the one on uh, digital objects. So there's a question in the Q&A box about Today, we're not only talking about heritage objects, but also digital objects. Do you consider digitization of heritage as a neo-colonial practice? Um, and I would like, I think it's a thought-provoking question also to think about the future and the digital. And um, um, may I invite all three of you to reflect on this, maybe beginning with... Um, no, I... I don't consider it as a neo-colonial practice. Also because some of the best examples of it that I've seen have been from artists activists who've actually started 3D printing objects which were stolen. Um, so there's a wonderful, and I'm, I'm uh, blanking on the name right now, but there's a wonderful artist who digitalized, um, I think it was a statue or like a bust, an Egyptian bust, which is in Berlin in the Pergamon Museum, yeah. and um, and shared the the 3D printing model online, so you could print it for yourself. So in that sense, taking away this idea of it being this solitary object present in that museum only for that 
uh, type of ownership. Um, so it can lead to different types of practices, which I find interesting. And also digitization also brings with it access. Um, so right now there's a whole project going on. And I think Wayne, you're involved with that as well, right? The digitization of the um, registries of, of um, I think it was in Suriname and now also in Curacao, all of the different logbooks have been digitized and people are now having access to their ancestors or to um, ways in which they can find more information. So in the wrong hands, it could lead to bad things. In the right hands, it could lead to interesting things. So for me, it's not the question of the technology. It's a question of the usage of it. Thank you. I think it's uh, true for many contemporary um, questions about technology, uh, Quincy. Um, Kiara, can I invite you to for a final uh, statement or reflection uh, specifically on digital objects, if you like? You mean on, on, digi on the digital? Um... Yeah, either on the digital or just a final reflection uh, uh, on the general topics, whatever you prefer. I mean, I, uh, well, I, on, on the digital, I largely agree with, so with, so with Quincy that it's not a matter of uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, evaluating the digital as such. There are really good digitalization projects and others that are extremely problematic. I mean, I, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, Quincy has mentioned some, um, and I know of another, like there are several digitalization efforts uh, that um, are, for example, geared towards uh, uh, um, supporting and expanding provenance research objects in the museums. I mean, Wayne uh, can talk way more about it than, uh, than me. And I, I know terrible digitalization projects that are extremely problematic and uh, that brings with themselves uh, a whole set of, um, uh, uh, of um, you know, very problematic concept. I can make an example that I think is a very interesting one. There are now a series of digitalization projects of Syrian heritage going on that on one end look extreme, first of all, extremely relevant given the, uh, you know, dramatic amounts and the, 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 the sort of the desperation of the loss of heritage in a place like Syria. And at the same time, all those projects are about collaborating with the Syrian regimes. So in a way, they can be seen as extremely vicious political projects of uh, regime support. So I think the digital is a very key. It on the one end, it's a very important um, platform for the kind of activism that we have talked about and also the transnational circulation of, of activist ideas and performances. You know, it's, it's like a, they give a huge resonance and at the same time, they uh, you know, they can be extremely problematic. And again, I just named a very sort of an extreme example of, uh, you know, uh, supporting authoritarian regimes by digitizing heritage objects. Uh, and again, it all looks, when, when you talk about shared heritage and saving and danger heritage, is all, it always looks very good. You get money from funders and policy makers, and it looks so uh, apolitical. For at times and uh, and safe, important to do, and yet it can be extremely political. And in a way, I mean, if I I I, I mean, it's it's difficult sort of to I could say so much to to as a final reflection, but I think in a way museums are precisely like that, very sort of powerful and ambivalent, and a very powerful and at the same time sort of ambivalent sites, ambivalent devices for talking about. Uh, and acting upon the, 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 the justice that we have and the violence that we have, uh, 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 you know, uh, discussed in this session. Thank you so much. Wayne, can you give a final reflection on ambivalence before we go home? Or we are at home, but figuratively um, speaking. Um, 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 very quickly, um, digitality is neocolonial if it holds coloniality in in if it supports coloniality. So basically, if it continues coloniality, then digitality does nothing to be decolonial. That is one thing that I'd say. There are many museums that want to keep the original and give the copies to others, right? So that is coloniality. Second, um, just in closing, actually, thank you for this discussion because one of the things that I've, for a long time, museums have 
in any way, um, have um, enjoyed the position of thinking that they did not occupy a really political position, that they were cultural institution that didn't do politics. And right now, despite the fact that this is a very precarious, tense, anxious, creative ever time, I find it an interesting moment that museums are the center of a discussion about what we are to be uh, in the world today. And I think that that is actually a, uh, museums need to hold, to, to be a part of that discussion and continue to force the discussion if we are to um, Im imagine new horizons where we, or more just horizons where we want to go rather than shying away from them. So my conclusion for this is just thank you for this because it just coincides with a necessary discussion that we as museums need to have if we are to reimagine what we as institutions can be for what, what our publics are or demand about. And Mia, I'd love to talk to you about your question because it's, Mia just wrote a question there. It's an excellent question. And we probably should read, um, the question is about Ariel Azule, about museums not being, uh, being full of people. It's a lovely question. Um, and we should talk, talk about it, especially in relationship to her book, Potential History, which everybody should read. Thank you, um, personally. Thank you so much, Wayne. And uh, yeah, I think one hour is, as we can yeah. see, it's not enough to, to go into this topic. There are so many good questions in the chat. I wish we could um, ask them all, but I, I really hope that we can use this conversation not as a final one, but as the beginning of a new kind of debate, a new kind of discussion to reimagine these new horizons. And I, I really want to thank all of you three for sharing your experiences, your expertise, your insights, your knowledge. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned so much. Um, I, I really like this, the, the notion of ambivalence and its relation to justice and humanity. Um, and I hope that we can continue this, uh, this conversation. I also would like to thank the audience for excellent questions, both in the chat and in the Q&A function. Um, and, we, and I really hope that we can continue one way or another, online or offline, this uh, important uh, discussion. Um, also want to draw quickly your attention to the next ACES decolonizing series, which is on the 25th of October with uh, Professor Jacobti, uh, moderated by Beste Ischleyen on provincializing Europe. Um, hope to see many of you are there. And again, a warm thank you uh, to our um, distinguished speakers in the panel. Um, and I wish you a very happy evening. <laughs>